platform. And uh, everyone, uh, let us pray as we gather around uh, the table of the Lord, the, the word of the Lord. Father God, we praise and we thank you for another opportunity where we can open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our souls to you and to your word. We ask, Lord, that your word would truly become living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it would pierce between the dividing of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrows. And it will truly uh, search our hearts, Lord, and change us and renew our minds where it's needed, Lord. We ask your blessing in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And uh, isn't the, this has been quite a different series, hasn't it? It hasn't been... Um, like for the faint heart, it's been pretty heavy stuff. We we talked about uh, the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist, many Antichrists, um, and uh, the apostasy, the great falling away that Paul talked about. Um, but these are really, I think, important issues, especially in these last days that we're facing. Um, and in a way, the church is really, um, it's being shaken along with the rest of the world. Church isn't the same as it always has been, meaning the organized structure of the building, um, you know, with COVID and with lockdown. Many leaders have had to restructure their planning, their program, even what we're doing here, a, a Zoom teaching. So it can be good. When we think of the early church, how they met from house to house, um, and and how it was more of a community rather than a organized um, structure. Not that there's anything against that, but uh, just the organic. You know, you know what they say. There's a, there can be a difference between organic and organizational. You know, you need structure. You, God is a God of order. But the organic church, the, the, where the Holy Spirit is knitting and uniting us together. Well, today, um, yeah, we're going to talk on deception, the, the, the dangers of deception, something that is, is a lot in the scriptures. And uh, we're going to look at some different aspects of deception. I, just to begin with, um, let me give a little personal uh, Thing that happened uh, about a year ago. Um, someone that I know, he started a, a part-time job working in a freshly squeezed uh, fruit juice and vegetable place. You know those places that you go to when you when you feel like something healthy, sweet maybe, and you go and you get your smoothie or your mixture. And uh, you go away and you feel good about yourself that you had something healthy, okay? So about a year ago, when he started working there, he, he told me, I wish he hadn't, but actually, no, I'm, I'm glad he did. He told me that with the, the, uh, the juice, the, the, not the vegetables, but the juices, they add sugar. I said, what? He said, we add sugar he said just about every place does that they don't sh we don't show people we're doing it and i said why what well, that defeats the purpose you come for something healthy and he said well we do it because um you know the sugar the sweetness will will people will enjoy it and they'll want to come back and i like and it's almost you know all of these years that I had these fruit drinks, thinking what a good disciplined boy I was instead of chocolate or ice cream. And now it was like, I felt, I felt like I'd been robbed. I felt deceived. I felt deceived. And I, I talked more about him and he said, you know, there are some people, they know this. And when they come, they say, no sugar, please. And so we stopped. So I actually went to a different place 
um, you know, a couple of weeks later or something. And I, or I ordered a drink and I said, oh, no sugar, please. And I looked, I saw their face. They looked me in the eye as if to say, you know, oh, you know, we put sugar in. So everyone check it out. When you go to a fruit and uh, vegetable place, make sure you ask or even ask them, do you put sugar in here? But I felt deceived all those years uh, where I thought I was eating healthy and the worst thing, you know what they say, the worst thing for you or one of the worst things apart from fried foods is, is sugar. And of course, we all love sugar. I was binging out on chocolate this week, okay? But, uh, but it's not good for you. Um, so anyhow, that's just a little story. How? But I, I felt so ripped off. I felt so upset. And, um, you know, some of us may have at a, on a spiritual level, on a theological level, uh, in a relationship, in a business deal, in something dramatic, we may have been deceived uh, in our lives. Uh, Jacob, you know what you know what they say. Jacob went to bed at night with uh, uh, Rachel, and he woke up with Leah. You know, he was deceived, and that's life in many ways. Even walking with God. Sometimes we, we step out of the boat and we walk on water thinking, not that it's God who deceives us, but sometimes the future or around the corner is hidden and we in our mind's eye and our mind's imagination, we think it's going to be a certain thing and it actually doesn't turn out to be that way at all. Reality bites. Um, but that's just life in general. I think today we're going to talk more about uh, what the Bible calls the spirit of deception, uh, demonic deception, theological deception, things like that. Now, the Lord warned us in the last days this will, will happen. And uh, in Matthew 24, he said, when the disciples said, what shall be the sign of the coming of the end of the age? We're, we're talking about the, 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 the end of the age, right? We're really coming into that. We don't know what, what hour we're at, but we're talking about it more and more. No question. We are uh, coming into those, that hour. And uh, what will be the sign? And look what the Lord said. He, the first thing he said, be not deceived. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And then in verse 23 of Matthew 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. If so, even the elect, if so possible, will be deceived. So watch out that no one deceives you is, the, is what the Lord saying. Now, I'm going to jump straight into what I believe is the key from the scriptures, the key thing that's going to keep us from falling into heavy deception. And I touched on this two weeks ago when in Second Thessalonians, when it talks about people who did not receive the love of the truth, but received the lie, God will send strong delusion. And, you know, when you think of that word delusion, everyone, look at the what is going on in the world today with, uh, you know, people getting married to dolphins, people identifying themselves as goths. Uh, do you know now that um, some parents won't uh won't allow their children to have a gender they say when the child and you're not allowed to call them a he or a she you you know what you you call them what, what they ask for you to call their babies they they a plural word okay i i watched it on on uh on an english peers uh morgan 
uh, an old uh, uh, replay. Uh, there was a there was a, a female couple, uh, and their child. They said we call this child a they. What delusion! This is the of course. If if I was to say that to them, I'd be accused of you know being nasty or bigot or whatever. Uh, so the, this is, you know, so many issues in our society. And I actually today at lunch, we were at a, a, a fellowship of lunch. Uh, one of the ladies, a Messianic Jewish lady um, from Australia, she's only been a believer for four years. She was heavily, she told her testimony, heavily involved in a satanic cult. And the leader was a professor at a, uh, a big university here in Israel. I'm not going to mention the name. But the, the top professor was the leader of this cult. And this person had a number of names. And they weren't the, like one of the names was Buddha. But it was a different name for Buddha. And she had another name. And it was for Jesus, Yeshua. It wasn't the name you sure, but this is the different personalities uh, this person had. And this lady who is a believer for four years, she was heavily, heavily into this for many, many years. Totally deceived, totally into it. I don't know if any of you have been into the new age or the occult. Uh, that's one area that I never got into. I mean, I, I lived a very simple life. But I didn't go down that road. I, I kind of had a something in me protected me from that, but um, not from other things. But anyway, um, it's it's a different world for me. Uh, when I talk to people about the occult, it fascinates me. It's hard for me to enter into it. But uh, you, if you've been into it, you know what I'm talking about. The power of deception. The power of the um, the occult, and uh, in uh, uh, let's go into the some of the scriptures. Now, I started to say the key thing that the scriptures teach us that is going to protect us from being deceived is what is reading the King James version only. No, it is the word truth. The word truth. The Lord Yeshua said to Pilate, whoever is of the truth, hears my voice. And of course, remember what is truth? And it's interesting. Have you ever wondered what tone he asked that question? Was, was he mocking? Was he actually mocking or was he actually um, really genuinely inquisitive? you know, what is truth? Or was he saying it in a mocking way? I don't know. But um, there are three things that I want to mention about truth that's really important. One is Jesus himself said, I am the truth. Okay, that's in John 14, 6. I mentioned this the other week. That truth is personified in the person, Yeshua, Jesus. Another second point about truth, Jesus himself said in John 17, when he prayed his high priestly prayer, he said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Okay, so Jesus himself is the truth. Your word is truth. And number three, the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 5, it says the Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus. And the Spirit is truth. And in John 14, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Now, I've given you three aspects of truth, but here's where deception comes in. We know that anything that God does, the enemy will try to infiltrate or to bring about a counterfeit 
a counterfeit. Okay. Now we, we all know we are believers. Jesus said, I am the truth. But are you aware that there are other Jesuses out there in the world? Do you know the Muslims believe in Jesus? He is one of their prophets, but he is a different Jesus. See, this is why we need Jesus as the person, the word of God, and the Holy Spirit. If we come across someone who believes in Jesus, but he doesn't line up with the word of God, he is a counterfeit Jesus. So the Muslims, a great example of a different Jesus. Do you know there is a new age Jesus, which is this testimony of this lady at lunch today. Her guru, this professor, the head of a university, top university in Israel, she called herself Jesus. That was one of her uh, new age names. If you go to South America, do you know what kind of Jesus a lot of the time is presented? He's called a Marxist Jesus. What do I mean? A kind of revolutionary with a gun, Che Guevara, a revolutionary that's going to overthrow tyranny and the oppressor and bring about liberation. This happens a lot, especially in South America. And in South Africa, actually, as well. In fact, this is often uh, called liberation theology. And that goes along with another kind of Jesus called an oriental Jesus, a guru. This is more the new age that I was talking about, like Buddha, like Socrates. And then lastly about Jesus, and this again, this is a deception where we only see Jesus as a loving, you know, little Jesus, meek and mild, okay? He's a sweet, loving Jesus. Now, that's one side, I call that a half-truth. It's truth, but it's a half-truth. And do you know what a half-truth is? It's a lie, okay? That's why we not only need the person Jesus, we need it to be backed up with the scriptures. Uh, here in Israel, there is a, um, a, a well-known messianic family. Some of the believers of that family are now believing in a Jesus that they believe he's God, but he is not a man. He, 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 he wasn't a man. Actually, the, um, the Muslims believe that when Jesus was on a cross, it wasn't actually Jesus on the cross. It was his angel or something like that. So, um, you know, you can get two extremes. The Jehovah's Witness, they believe he's the opposite. They believe he's, he was a man, but just the Mashiach, not the son of God. So um, we need to be careful. And look, look, guys, if we're struggling with who Jesus is, there's grace as we're learning who he is we're all still we know him and we're still getting to know who he is uh, that's part of like a marriage you know your partner but you're still getting to know them and it's the same with the lord jesus we know him but we're still getting to know him and after all look what the what the lord said to peter flesh and blood has not revealed this but my father only so there is an element of trust in the holy spirit to bring about more revelation and that's why paul prayed for the churches at ephesus at corinth at Co in, in uh at uh in Co coloss coloss how i think you said it that way where he prayed for the eyes of their understanding that they would be enlightened to know the breadth the width the height the depth and to know the love of Christ. So um, we're all wrestling for truth. But we got to, um, we I think we need the Holy Spirit to help us with that. So that's number one key point, the truth of who Jesus is. And it's got to line up with scripture. Now, the other thing, 
Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but over the last 2,000 years, there have been approximately 40, 40 uh, false Jewish messiahs. 40, that's a lot. And this is what the Lord said what, when they asked, what will be the coming of the sign of your times? And he said, uh, there will be many false Christs, uh, people who come and say, I am the Christ. Some of those names of those false messiahs you may know, probably the two, the three most famous are uh, in the second century, uh, a famous man called Shimon Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba led uh, the revolt against the Romans, the second revolt, not the first, the second revolt. And it was the famous spiritual leader, Rabbi Akiva, who told the Jewish people to follow Shimon Bar Kokhba as the Messiah. And do you know what happened at that time? All the Jews were one, pretty much one together, including the Messianic Jews. But when Rabbi Akiva told all the Jews to follow Bar Kokhba as the Messiah, the Messianic Jews, they said, no, sorry, we, we can't do that. We believe someone else is the Messiah. His name is Yeshua. And so Rabbi Akiva put what's called a cherem. That's a Hebrew word for an excommunication over the Jewish believers. And it was from that moment, that was about 135 AD, that the Messianic Jews, the Jewish followers of Jesus, became a cherem, a curse word to the Jewish community. And it's lasted until today, although things are changing. That's a different story. But, and, and it's also believed that, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but when, you know how in English, when people, you know, they swear or they curse and they sometimes they say, oh, Jesus, you know, they, I used to do that when, before I was a believer, like as a curse word. Well, there's the equivalent in Hebrew. They don't say Yeshua. They say Yeshu. Yeshu. And it's three Hebrew letters. Yudshin Val, uh, Yudshin Ayin. And it's actually believed to be an acronym for three Hebrew words, which means Yimach Shmo Uzikro. And you know what that means? May his name be blotted out. And it's believed that Rabbi Akiva gave Yeshua that nickname, Yeshu, Yimach Shmo Uzikro, may his name be blotted out. And today, even if you watch a movie and it's got subtitles, when, they, when someone swears it's an American movie and they'll say Jesus, it's translated Yeshu, Yeshu, not Yeshua, Yeshu. I'm often talking with Israelis and they will use the name Yeshu, and I'll turn to them and I'll say, do you know what the, the name Yeshu means? And they go, oh, it's the, you know, uh, Yeshu from 2,000 years ago. And, I, and, and I'll tell them, I'll say, actually, it's an acronym, and it means may his name be blotted out. They like, they, most Jews don't have a clue about that. But um, it came from a false uh, messiah, Shimon Bar Kokhba, and the spiritual lead, leader, uh, Rabbi Akiva. Another famous uh, or infamous uh, fake, fake false messiah was a man called Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi uh, in about the 18, it was at the 17th, 18th century. And he strongly convinced a lot of Jews to follow him as the messiah. And then guess what happened? This was during the Muslim period when the Muslims were in control and the Muslims captured Shabtai Tzvi and they said to him, convert to Islam or we'll kill you. And you know what he did? He converted to Islam. He became a Muslim. So, so much for a false Messiah. And the last one, just to make mention of, is from the 20th century, a man from Brooklyn, New York, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Anyone heard that name before? He's, yes, he's the leader of the Lubavitch uh, movement. Now, for those of you who have come to Israel, and when we're on the bus, we're traveling everywhere, 
Remember that poster that you see everywhere of a man with a with a black coat and a black hat with a white beard? No, not Father Christmas. It is Menachem Mendel Schneerson. And in Hebrew, it says Melech HaMashiach Chai. And it means King Messiah lives. And they, some of his following, not all of them, they believe that he is the Messiah. And I have personally spoken to members of his movement. They believe he is going to rise from the dead and he is one day going to come back. That's what they believe. They hand out booklets. So, and he was a brilliant man. He could, he could write with both hands. He knew about, I think, 14 different languages. Uh, incredible man. Uh, and a, they actually purchased some land here in Israel, and they, they built a house for him for when he comes back. So uh, they're, they're uh, now to, to give him some credit, he himself never claimed to be the Messiah, just some of his followers. But this is a real thing, everyone. And you've probably heard of the Jerusalem syndrome, where about 100 people a year, they think they're either King David, uh, uh, Elijah the prophet, or, um, or a false messiah. And I've met a number of them over the years. This is a real thing. You've had a few cases there in the United States. What was that Jewish guy in Waco? Uh, was it in Waco, Texas? Kor Korish or someone, David Korish, was it? Is that the name? You're going to have to unmute yourself. His name was David Koresh. David Koresh. Was that the place in Waco, Texas, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And um, look what he did. And he led a lot of people into deception. And there are gurus. And there's, there's places here in Israel where uh, communities as well. It's real, everyone. It's real. Even the elect, the Lord said. So we need to be discerning. We need to know our word. We need to study our word. And we need to know what deception really is. You know, the English language says that deception is the act of making someone believe something that is not true. To mislead by a false appearance or statement. Of course, this is what happened right from the Garden of Eden when the serpent gave the false appearance that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not only harmless, but it would actually be beneficial to the woman. He also lied when he told the woman, you will not die. Okay, so she was uh, deceived. Now, um, uh, What I'm, I'm going to suggest that there are three key elements that open the door up to uh, deception. Three key things. One is pride. Actually, I, I thought I had three. I've listed two here. Uh, pride and rebellion. Pride and rebellion. Now, pride. We all know about it, according to a lot of scholars. That's what led Satan himself, Lucifer, to rebel against God. He wanted to be exalted and elevated. He wanted uh, to, um, to challenge God. So pride, number one. And number two, rebellion. Rebellion. Now, usually rebellion comes out when people carry hurts that are not healed and um, they can actually get shipwrecked in their faith. I'm talking about believers here. Uh, and they, uh, they get hurt by a leader, a pastor, someone in the church. And we've probably all experienced that at one stage or another. And it's a tough one. It's a tough one. We get um, offended at the church, we can even get offended with God as a result. And what do we do? We either um, get shipwrecked in faith or we actually end up rebelling. And we just say, I don't want any of this. You Christians, 
are a bunch of hypocrites. You've heard that before. Um, you know, I know non-believers that are more loving than you believers. Have you heard that one before? We all have. We've all been hurt by members of the body. And that's a hard one. And we need to be careful that we don't turn it or we don't open the door to either pride or rebellion. And, uh, and I've seen it. I've seen it many, many times uh, over the last many, over a number of decades, actually, uh, where people rebel, that spirit of rebellion. You know, when Samuel was told to, uh, I'm sorry, um, Saul, King Saul was told to wait for Samuel by Samuel and Saul didn't wait. He offered up a sacrifice. And you know what Samuel said when he came back? In 1 Samuel 15, this is what he said. The sin of rebellion is as witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. It's a pretty heavy loaded uh, verse. Rebellion is as witchcraft, it says. And stubbornness is as idolatry. Have you ever gotten to a, a debate with someone? You're trying in a loving way, like we all try, right? And uh, when you, you know, don't see eye to eye, actually, I was talking earlier about a, a leader of a congregation here in Israel. Um, he strongly believes in one side of the COVID. I'm not going to go into which side, but he believes either you shouldn't be vaccinated or you should. Okay, he's taken one side. But members, leaders of his congregation don't agree with him. And actually, it's the leaders who are becoming stubborn about it. They won't tolerate anyone in the congregation with a difference of a, of a point of view. And I don't agree with that. I think as long as you respect each other and are not trying to force it down anyone's throat. But this is what it says in First Samuel 15. Stubbornness is as idolatry. When people have an opinion and they're stubborn about it, they won't change or they become dogmatic. It becomes like an idol. Their opinion. This is what Samuel said. Stubbornness is as idolatry and we i think we need to be careful as well as believers even because on one hand we're told to have conviction we're to love truth we're to fight for truth we're to get all we're, we're to sell everything to get the truth but and i've said this a number of times this month paul talks about speaking the truth in love what good is if i know all mysteries and everything but have not love. And uh, has, has any of you ever been in a, in a theological debate or a social issue debate? And um, it's got a little bit heated, you know, with your relatives, pol what is it, politics, religion, those two biggies. Um, have you ever, you know, uh, tried to convince the other of your opinion and it gets hot? You know, that feeling? It's better to walk away. It's better to just say, hey, it's okay. We, let's just agree to disagree. How many of us do that, though? I went many years where I couldn't walk away. <laughs> I had to be right, or I, I needed that person to, you know, affirm my opinion. Um, and remember the example I gave uh, by, by rabbis, um, about uh, there was a uh, no sorry it was a rabbi he did he was a psychologist and he did a research and he found out that children the thing that makes them more happy uh, sorry the the reason why when they get into an argument they can let it go after five minutes because for children the most important thing for them is to be happy but for adults he studied that when they're, they're offended, they can hang on to it for five years, for, for, for five decades. And why his conclusion is because for adults, it's more important for them to be right than to be happy. For children, for them, 
happy. For adults, it's being right. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. We're, we're to be defenders of the faith, okay? Defenders of the truth, but not at the expense of, you know, damning or becoming stubborn that our opinion becomes uh, like an idol, idolistic. Um, I know, I know, as I said before, there is a place for conviction and belief and to say, I'm not changing my mind. But this is what Paul said, speaking the truth in love. There's a way that I think we're all learning more and more how to, um, how to do that. Now, there are many examples in scriptures about deception, and we're just going to go over a few to give different aspects of what deception looks like. Um, uh, and it's not just in scripture, it's in our society. For example, number one, I put down as religion. Uh, there are many religions in the world today. And the religion at the time of the Lord Yeshua and the early apostles, what was the main religion? Judaism. Judaism. Now, the thing about Judaism, and this is the subtle thing, Judaism has a lot of truth you know you take a born-again christian and you take a sadiq or a hasidic uh righteous god-fearing jew and uh you sit down with them you know my money would probably be on the the orthodox jew knowing his bible far better than a born-again christian that doesn't mean anything that doesn't mean he's better i'm just objectively saying um but what is the issue what is the issue if the issue is eternal life then guys there's only x 412 the early apostles said there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved and the jewish people at the time they were trusting of course in the sacrificial system and in the, uh, in the Torah, in their Judaism, and all of that. And um, it's interesting today, there is no temple. And so when you talk about to, to Jewish people, and I believe next month, we're actually going to do a series on evangelism. And, we, and it's not just going to be the Jewish people, but evangelism in general. And we're going to discuss some of these things. But uh, when, when a, a Jewish person today with no temple, what do they trust in? Uh, you know, I told the story before that when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, the Jewish leaders were facing a crisis. No temple, no sacrifices for sin, no priesthood, because all the priestly documents were burned when Titus and the Romans uh, uh, burned the temple. So what was their Judaism without a temple, without a priesthood, without sacrifices for sin? And so in the second century, you know what they came up with? A Judaism called rabbinic Judaism. And that's the mainstream Judaism that we have today. And you try talking to a, a, a rabbi in that system um, about Jesus being, you know, uh, our righteousness you know unless the holy spirit opens his eyes it's kind of like it's like speaking chinese to them so we're talking about you know again it depends what the issue is you know if you're talking about god's covenant people you know the jewish people they can they've got biblical foundation to say we are still god's covenant people and they are but so are the Gentiles, because the Gentiles who believe in Jesus have been grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. So um, anyhow, one has to be careful when we look at religions. Look at the Muslim religion, Islam. 1.4 billion people on the planet Earth following this religion. And the Catholic, the Catholic system Religion is a powerful tool, everyone. And here is where we can be deceived. If part of that religion offers 
a good community, a loving community that you're not finding in Christianity. In fact, you're finding the opposite. People are backstabbing, people are gossiping, you know, in what should be the loving, the best community. Then you go to a Muslim or a Jewish or a Buddhist or a Hare Krishna community where they're all loving and just join in and let's just hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That love and acceptance, that is what can deceive us, everyone. You see? You understand? Do you know uh, where I come from in New Zealand? Do you know one thing that really draws young people in? Street gangs. Gangs. Bikies. Why? Because people find identity. They find acceptance. They find community in these gangs. And there's a power in community. And remember that book that I quoted to you, I think it was a couple of weeks ago from Dr. Larry Crabb called Connecting. And he talks about the power of community. And I'm not talking about a church on, on Saturday or Sunday, everyone, which is only two or three week, two or three hours a week. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about community. I'm talking about every day. If you look at the early church, where they searched the scriptures daily and they, they, they had a lot more close-knit community living. And this is where our deepest needs get met, where the Lord uh, sometimes, or, or at least this is one way how the Lord does meet our needs through community. Another area of, of uh, deception, everyone, so number one is through religion and through community. Number two uh, is uh, 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 an area where of danger is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Now, none of us here uh, ever struggle with that, I'm sure, right? What is self-righteousness? Self-righteousness is so subtle. It's so subtle. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Do you remember when David, he took Bathsheba, slept with her, sent her husband out into the front line, got him drunk, got him killed, went on business as usual, everything fine. So Nathan the prophet comes along and he says to David, he tells him a little parable of uh, two neighbors. One had a lot of sheep. And one only had one sheep. And the man who had a lot of sheep, he took the other neighbor's one sheep, okay, for a sacrifice, for a, for a party. And when David heard the story, remember what David said? He said, that man should die. And Nathan's response simply was, you are that man. And it was like, wow. You know, the camera zoomed in on David's face. And uh, what was going on? This is the thing that really startles me about the story. When David heard the story, he had such a sense of uh, a love for truth, a love for the poor neighbor, a love for righteousness, a love for what was right and a hatred for what was wrong. Right? That's what he had when he was listening to the story. And he, he came down as the judge. That man should die. He saw that that man was so wrong. But here is the self-deception. David did not look at himself. He saw the log in the man, uh, in the story's eye, but he did not see the plank in his own eye. He was so self-deceived. And Nathan busted him. You know, you're busted, man. You are, you know, you're, uh, you're guilty. And, and David said, I, I, I get it. I get it. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I repent. He said, I have sinned. Uh, Luke 18, another example, verse 9, he also told this parable 
to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be sinful, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, the, the, the verse of scripture that really hits me when I think of these two stories of David and the tax collector, it's Proverbs 11.1. 1. Proverbs 11.1 1 says, a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A false balance is an abomination, but a just weight is his delight. Now, do you know in the, in the Talmud and the Mishnah, they have a lot of teachings about false balances in everyday areas of our lives. When you go, here, here's a couple of examples. When you exaggerate a truth, do you know that that's a false balance? When, you know, when you're trying to convince someone, you, you really exaggerate, you know, that, that, that this, uh, a false balance is an abomination. Even how we judge people, you know, if you took someone, uh, let's take, for example, okay, you remember in the book of James, remember James said, when someone comes into your building, who's dressed in good attire and a suit and a tie. You, you, you say to him, hey, you sit in the best place. And James, he, he, had, he had issues with that congregation. He said, and, and the poor, lowly esteemed man, you, you, you tell him to sit somewhere else. He says, you're judging people in a wrong way. So in a way, that's a, a, that's a false balance. Now, if you took a man in the church who was living a open homosexual life with another man, what would you do? And then you took the, the, the example I just gave of a person who tells a man in the nice suit to sit in, a good, in the best place, okay? Who would you judge is better or worse? Be careful what you say. And I'll tell you why. Because it says if a man lays with a man, this is an abomination unto the Lord. Okay, that's clear. But Proverbs 11.1 1 says a false balance is also an abomination unto, a, unto the Lord. So what's worse in the eyes of the Lord? Both are false. Uh, our abomination. So when, when we judge situations, we need to be really careful how we weigh up. And of course, we all like to play the judge. Um, and, and some people become very judgmental. And uh, this is something that the law takes very, very seriously. Now, we know that there are two sides. Remember earlier I mentioned there's a Jesus that some people in the church love, and it's that lovey-dovey Jesus. He just, it's all love. There's no, he doesn't preach sin. He doesn't preach judgment. He, he's all love. And we need to be careful with that kind of Jesus because there's, there's two sides. There's, there's God's judgment and there's God's mercy. And they're both needed. They're both needed. Jesus will come back to, to judge the quick and the dead. He will be the judge. But he is also merciful. So where's the balance? We need it. Now, what's interesting is Paul, to give it balance, guess what he says? He says that God's mercy triumphs over judgment. 
So remember that when you're weighing up an issue, this is a, this is a mind blower because we're talking about a false balance here. You've got mercy and you've got judgment. You've got to get both sides. But Paul gives a third truth here by saying that God's mercy actually triumphs over his judgment. So I guess at the end of the day, we all need wisdom to know God, when is it okay to, to make a firm, angry judgment? You know, isn't it, doesn't Paul also say, be angry, but sin not? But he actually says, be angry. There is a righteous anger. Uh, but then on the other hand, you know, we're to be loving. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you love one another. So these, this, is, this, this is all part of us wrestling for the truth. Wrestling. Remember what I said before, the three elements of the truth. There's the biblical Jesus. There is the word of God. And then there's the Holy Spirit who will lead us into all truth the spirit of truth, and the spirit of wisdom. May God give us this wisdom that we need. Um, and then one last uh, example um, about how people um, can be deceived. Galatians 6, 9. And this speaks to David, King David. Be not deceived. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows okay it's that same old issue can we go on sinning that grace may abound well the answer is yes and no but we don't know when look at samson he played around but then one day it says he did not know it but the lord had departed from him i'm not talking about losing our salvation here i'm talking about when god decides to bring about a judgment on our lives. And I believe it's scriptural. He did it to Ananias and Sapphira in the early church. Paul, when he spoke to the church at Corinth, when they were involved in such carnality, and he talked about when you take the Lord's Supper, be careful, do it with reverence. So this is a solid warning to us all. Um, about playing with sin and um, and playing around with false balances, everyone. You know, our income tax, our, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So may God give us wisdom and, and, and actually, there is one other key point about the, the dangers of being deceived, and that is our understanding of who God is, our understanding of who God is. Remember a few weeks back, I did a teaching on the parable of the talents. One, had, one was given five, one was given 10, one was given one. The one with 10 went and used the 10 and he made more. The one with five, he used the five and he made more. But the one who only had the one, what did he do? He buried it in the ground. And he what, when the, when the uh, master came, what was the, the man's response? He said, I knew you were a hard, cruel master. This was a wrong concept of his master. And this is something that all of us have to be so careful with our study of scripture that we don't allow any wrong misconception of who God is. Otherwise, it can open the door for deception. And I've given, I've already given some examples, you know, that God is just all loving and he doesn't judge sin or, or the other extreme where he's just totally you know, he's got a stick in his hand and he's ready to, to beat you when you make a mistake or when you do sin um, because we all struggle with sin and the flesh and the weakness of man. So may, may God help us to um, 
with with the the the, the theological issues that we're all wrestling with and we are we're all wrestling with with to try and you know discern truth um some years ago i did a paper on what's called epistemology and epistemology basically means the uh, study of truth and basically it's how uh, uh, why i believe what i believe you know for example if i asked you why you believe that uh, Jesus is alive. Okay, ask yourself this question: Why do you believe that Jesus is alive? And what would your answer be? Where Where do you go for your source of of answer? Now, some people would say the Old Testament. Some people would say the New Testament. Some people would say, "Well, I feel it. My feelings." Um, where is your source? Why do you believe in what you believe? Because sometimes in every one of these um, uh, areas like the Bible, sometimes we will get to a place where we, we come up like we, we hit the wall. What do I mean? There are some issues in life that are not found in the Bible. You're looking at me ready to stone me asking what is he talking about well i'll give you a couple of examples contraception contraception where's that in the bible that's not in the bible actually if i wanted to i could try to bring a really good case against it or what about having a, for a man having a vasectomy you know or um, what about artificial insemination? Now, when I say it's not in the Bible, maybe you can come up with some verses and we can talk about it in a minute where you can have some good scriptures to back up your argument. But sometimes uh, we, there, there are, it's not so easy. Sometimes there are, here's a good one. The vaccine for COVID. Should I take it or should I not take it? If, if your only source for finding answers in life is the Bible, sometimes we, we don't find answers in the Bible. That's not to downplay the Bible. Sometimes we need the witness of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we need in the multitude of counselors. Sometimes we need common opinion you know everyone is saying it's safe okay sometimes common opinion is the wrong advice you know a tradition something that has lasted for hundreds of years and just because it's a common opinion you might find something in the bible or something about it where you actually realize you know what i don't agree with it i think it's wrong a tradition in your church let me give you an example you may not like this example by the way the early church they called sunday the sabbath many christians in the united states and in the western world they call sunday that's my sabbath Okay, now Sunday is not the Sabbath. In the New Testament, there were two holy days in the New Testament. There's the Sabbath, and then there is the first day of the week. And what is the first day of the week? It's called the Lord's Day. It was the day that the early followers celebrated the resurrection of the Lord. That's what it is. It's called the Lord's Day. It's not called the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day before. So the early believers, they went from one holy day, which was the Sabbath, to two holy days, the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Do you get it? It's logical. But the tradition now is, no, the Sabbath, it's, it's irrelevant. 
it's Sunday. Actually, if I really got into this, I could show you from history that the word Sunday was actually given in the fourth century by the organized church. Uh, and it was a day, the first day of the week, where people worshipped the sun god. That's why it's called the sun day. That's where we get that name, sun day from. And Monday is where they worship the moon god. Even Saturday is where they worship Saturn, the planet Saturn. So um, we could, we, you know, we could go really deep into this. But guys, all I'm talking about is it's okay to wrestle for truth. It's, it expands our minds. I believe, I think it was August, St. Augustine. He said, the unexamined life is a life not worth living. It's okay for our beliefs to be challenged. But we come back to the scriptures. That is our foundation, the word of God. And if there are issues like COVID, you know, uh, should I take it? Should I not? and we can't find something in the scriptures, then where do we go? We, do we go simply to the Lord in prayer? Do we go to a leader and ask you know, for Holy Spirit guidance? Do we go to common uh, opinion? Uh, do we go to a doctor? These are, these are tough questions, um, but it's all about protecting ourselves from deception. And like I said, the two key doors, I believe, that open us up for deception is one, pride. When we think we know everything, we think we know all the answers, and I'm better, and my opinion is more important than your opinion. Number one, and the other door that really opens up is rebellion. And usually rebellion comes when we're holding on to a hurt somewhere. And uh, we, our opinion becomes like an idol and we don't want to hear anyone. We close the door. We become lone soldiers. May God protect us from deception in the last days. This is a huge topic. Uh, I know it's been a bit scattery here and there, but I hope it's given us food for thought, things to think of. And I want to finish with one verse from... Um, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, actually two verses. One is Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, when the Lord said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. See that personal relationship. Remember what the Lord said to the Pharisees? He said, you search the scriptures for in them, you, th you think that you have eternal life and they are they that speak of me, but you won't come to me. See how he makes the scriptures very personal. He is the personification, everyone. And then lastly, I want to just talk, uh, I want to finish by telling a story of deception to any of us who have heavily been deceived in life to show that God is bigger than any deception where we may have tripped up, where we may have fallen, where we may have been severely uh, deceived by fruit juices with sugar in or whatever it may be. But you know the story when Jacob and Esau were in the womb of Rebekah and God spoke to Rebekah and said, in your belly are two nations. The older will serve the younger. And you remember, fast forward it many years later when it came time for her husband, Isaac, to bless Esau because Esau was the older one. And Rebecca was thinking, hang on. If I allow my husband, Isaac, to bless Esau, then it's not going to work out what he told me when they were in the womb. So what did she do? She went about scheming and planning and she told her other son Jacob to dress up in the hairy arms and so what happened remember what Jacob said he said uh he said I can't I'm paraphrasing you know I can't deceive my father what if he finds out 
And remember what Rebecca said? She said, may the curse be upon me. So Jacob went along and he came up to blind Isaac. And Isaac said, the arms are Esau's, but the voice is Jacob. See, Isaac was pretty much blind. He only had partial sight. And uh, later on, after Jacob had got the blessing, Esau came. And remember, Jay, uh, Isaac said, who, who is it? And he said, it's your son, Esau. And if you, if you read it, it's like Isaac was like, what? They couldn't believe it. And um, Esau was so angry, so upset. And he said, rightly so is my brother's name, Jacob, for a deceiver. That's what Jacob means, a deceiver. But guys, what I think is incredible about this is that even though it was a, a story of deception, what we see, you know, you know who I believe is the central or one of the central characters in the story? It's Rebecca, because she wanted to see the promises of God being fulfilled. God spoke to her in the womb. The older will serve the younger. And she could not see how it was going to work out. In a minute or two, her husband was going to bless Esau. So she brought about this deception. And you know what? It cost her her life, everyone. It cost her her life because she died. She died sometime later. And not only that, it brought about such a split in that family because Jacob and Esau became arch enemies. She lost pretty much both of her sons. Jacob had to flee. And uh, Esau obviously heard about what happened. And, the, you know, so deception, guys, is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Even, the, even if we think we're bringing about God's promises and God's plan. It's wrong. But you know what? In this story, don't you see a message of the cross? Because here we have Rebecca. She was willing when she said, the curse be upon me for the sake of seeing the promises of God being fulfilled. And fast forward that about 3,000 years, we see how the enemy he thought he was fulfilling his lusts and passion by orchestrating that spirit of Antichrist through Pilate, through the Pharisees. They hung the Lord Jesus on the cross, but he became the curse, everyone. Just like Rebecca became the curse so that the blessing could fall upon her son, Jacob. The Lord Yeshua, he became the curse for us that the blessing may come upon us. And guys, we're, if we've been deceived and it's, it's caused pain and loss and hurt, trust in the Lord. He can turn it around. He can bring good out of it. And may we all be lovers of truth, lovers, seekers of truth. And as we are, asking the Lord for a spirit of discernment, the gift of discernment. As we wrestle for truth, may God give us clarity in these last days where deception is going to abound more and more. We're going to see it in the church. I talked about this. The Lord said, the man of lawlessness will not be revealed until first there will be the great falling away. And that Greek is the word apostasia the great falling away it's gonna happen and he, and paul's talking about within the body of the lord we're gonna see it and may god not only protect us but may he use us to be correctors in a in a, a, you know um a vessels where we can see see um uh false teaching and may God use us to bring correction. Amen. 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 Good teaching, Aaron. Very, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gary.
so much to share on that, you know, but, you know, I'm glad everything, everything I taught you, brother, you were able to share today. That was <laughs> Thank perfect, you. Jeff. Perfect, perfect example of pride, right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned truth. You know, all truth is contained in the Bible, as you, as you agree with me on that. But the all truth, but, but, Bible contains all truth, but all truth is not in the Bible. As that, that's a good way of saying it, you know? Yeah. There's just so much. But I think if you look at the concepts, like you were sharing about the concepts, even things like, should we take the coronavirus, uh, the, the shot of the coronavirus? I think if we really search the scriptures, even that concept would be, that answer would be in the Bible, you know, if we look at it really carefully. I think everything in the Bible is, if you look at the concept of it, you know, I think we can find the answers to stuff, you know, just like contraception. You mentioned contraception. We don't we read in the Bible about the, the man who spilt his seed and he was killed. God killed him because he spilt his seed on the ground versus having a child. I mean, you know, again, if we look at the Bible on, on the concepts, we might be able to find all the answers. That's just my my opinion, whatever that's worth. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, anybody want to comment on uh, on that, or or anything else? Well, that could be a long okay. discussion. <laughs> um, I just have a, a quick story on deception. Um, about six or seven years ago, <clears throat> I discovered halal meat, and I grew up with kosher meat, and then got away from it for years. And I thought, oh, this is awesome because I love Indian food and the Indian grocer sells halal meat and it's slaughtered the same way that kosher meat is slaughtered. And so I had been eating that and telling people about it for about six years. And I'm sitting in my tour club one day and my leader says, uh, not to burst your bubble or anything, but are you aware that when they slaughter the animal, they offer up a prayer to Allah. And I said, no, no, tell me it isn't so, right? So I look it up and all that. And then I look up the scriptures and it says, you know, one of the things that Paul said that even the Gentiles aren't supposed to do is eat meat that's offered to idols. And like you, I just felt so deceived. I mean, not on purpose, but that I had just been deceived. I didn't know the truth. So now I have to eat that nasty stuff they sell in the grocery store, but <laughs> I can't eat my hell out of meat anymore. Yeah. And that is a great story or great testimony of how, yeah, we can do things with good intentions. And, uh, and I love the fact that in the Bible, there are sacrifices for uh, unintentional sins. There's what's called the trespass offering. God knows we're going to make mistakes, uh, and even with good intentions. So, yeah, but but what a what a what a shock it must have been to you when when he said that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So my problem, and and I've seen this in the church, is there's a tendency to not think about something and determine whether it's true, but if it fits with what we already think. We accept it and pass it on. So I'm going to say, uh, let's see, can I? So I had a friend that posted on his Facebook picture of the Bible. This is my fact checker. So all I did was ask, is the vaccine safe? What's the Bible say? And he started going off on all kinds of things. And because the Bible doesn't tell us if the vaccine's safe. Uh, now, I'm going to, I'm going to, Put my spin on life because I'm a scientist and the church quite frankly has abandoned science and I, I, I've seen some data and I have a suspicion of when that happened but the man who created the scientific method documented the scientific method was a Christian and we've abandoned science and so part of the problem is there's this attitude of we're Christians, we know everything. And so we don't have to listen to science. We don't have to listen to this. We don't have to evaluate what we're, what we're what's being said. And I, I find Christians, when you present facts to them, 
they don't determine whether or not it's true. They just determine whether or not it fits with what they believe. And, and that's a level of taking us into a deception. That's a problem. So I, I just, I think critical thinking has been removed from the church. And I think that we need to think about things well, because when I, uh, I when I look at data, I determine whether or not it fits with what I believe, and then I got to figure out what I'm going to do with that data. So um, I can't remember the the TV guy. That's uh, my favorite quote, and and um, can't remember his name. And it, uh, he's not necessarily even a Christian. He may be uh, a later day saint guy, but he said, "Know what you believe, and why you believe it." See, everybody knows what they believe. If you know what you believe and why you believe it, somebody comes up and says something different than what you believe, and you find out why they believe it, then you can evaluate that. And there's there's all kinds of, you know, and so if the data that he has is better than my data, I can change my mind. We don't, you know, there's there's all kinds of data that you can actually verify about what's going on. But people, when you challenge them with data, they just have decided on their own. And and I'll I'll toss up my my very favorite one. My friend told me that Donald Trump is still the president because he never. And and if you want to argue about this, we can argue about it. He says he never he never conceded the election, so he's still president. And so I sent him a copy of the 20th Amendment of the Constitution. It says, on January 20th at noon, it ends. And he still fights about it. And so there, there's, I think deception comes in when we, and I think it's that, that, that mindset that you talked about. It's, it's kind of, a, it's not uh, rebellion as a rich crap, but it's, it's this mindset that we're right. And we don't even evaluate whether we're right. So right, that's, right. That's, uh, that's my thought. I think that, uh, I think that there's, there's, there's been a rejection of science. And as a result, our science has lost its way. And it's not because science is wrong. It's because we've lost the ethical and uh, biblical truth that comes through scientists being Christian. So that's my thought. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, I, I know definitely the place for science. And, um, and of course, there are wonderful Christians out there who are scientists like you, Paul, who are trying to use science to prove uh, not only the, the um, existence of God, but um, using creation as mm -hmm. well as a tool for evangelism and of course the the australian guy ken ham with the, the yeah. what is it, the the museum there in uh kentucky ohio wherever it is yeah um, my favorite scientific fact i was listening to a science show after i became a christian and they came out and they said all of the mitochondrial dna so the mitochondria is a, a part of the cell all of the mitochondrial DNA in the entire gene pool came from one, a single, one single woman. And then, of course, they said her name was not Eve, so I'm not sure how they know that. So you look at science and you look at what science is beginning to prove. It lines up with scripture. Hmm. Interesting. If we ignore it, we'll never see that. And if we ignore it, we'll never see those parts that conflict with scripture and, and insert a biblical ethics to it so mm. anyways thank you thank you do you want to say well, something oh yeah can i just add something we tend to mm. look at a very surface explanation uh there's a drosh you know the explanation of things like onan for an example we can look at the situation of onan and say oh see there there there's birth control right there but Onan refused to raise up a child for his brother. It's deeper than that. It's more complicated than that. And we don't tend to look at all sides of the situation. We look at the one little portion of it. Oh yeah, that justifies birth control or doesn't justify birth control. When it was really a lot more complicated, it had to do with his motive his refusal to be obedient to the word of God to raise up a child for his brother. 
Yeah, good point. Very good point. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. You know, the, this whole issue of deception, it, you know, one, one area I actually wanted to talk a little bit about on, but I didn't. It's, it's in the area of prophecy in the church. And um, that's an area where uh, a lot of deception can uh, come in, um, where people give a date or, you know, they, they talk about this is going to happen. Do you remember Y2K in, in uh, December 1999, December the 31st at uh, 1159 at midnight, 59 seconds, or when it was going to turn to the new millennium? There was going to be a huge uh, breakdown and the, the, the stock market was going to crash. And I know someone in Jerusalem, uh, actually, he's, he's passed on now, David Wilkinson from the Times Square Church in New York. He came and he said it was going to crash. And, um, and I love David Wilkinson and his story and what he's done, but it didn't crash, didn't crash. And I think, and he... I, one, one man who was talking about Donald Trump going to get reelected, he actually went public and he, he apologized. He said, I, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. It's okay to get it wrong. We, we, we're, not in the, we're not in the days of stoning. But I think if you've got a following and if you've got an influence and you're out there giving a prophecy and you don't get it right, okay. Just humbly say, I, I didn't get it right. There's a key verse in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, listen to what it says. It says, let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. Now, have you heard of some people who are leaders and they, you're not allowed to challenge their word. Oh my goodness. Don't, don't touch the Lord's anointed, you know? Uh, but it actually, it's the opposite. It says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. We have a responsibility, everyone, to be judges. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not despise prophecy, test all things. So where to, where to test? Um, uh, one, one, uh, one has to test everything and we are to judge. And if we're going to speak up for the Lord and say, thus says the Lord, we have to be open to being, you know, judged. And as certainly if we're wrong, we need to, you know, publicly admit it. All right, good. We, this is getting a little spicy. That's okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Someone's commented, I disagree. They were prophecies. Millions were spent in anticipation of Y2K. We can never know what would have happened. Not sure I understand what that means. Um, uh, I disagree. They were prophecies. Oh, I see. Well, no, no. He actually, I was in the auditorium when he actually said it. He actually used the word prophesy. He said, I prophesy. Uh, and I was like, wow. I, I hardly had any money on me at a few hundred dollars. But I was like, well, I don't want that to go to waste. And uh, when it didn't come true, um, then I began to think, well, hang on. Um, I only had a few hundred. What say I had a few hundred thousand? And I made radical decisions based on his word. So, um, yeah, like, like a, oh, I've got, someone's asking me, um, what did he say? I've never heard it. Well, I, I, I'm not saying thus says the law, but I was there in the auditorium and I remember him saying, uh, I prophesy that at Y2K, the stock market will crash. In fact, if it, I think it was the same meeting, this, this one I'm not 100% sure. If it wasn't the same meeting, it was, in the, it was just before Y2K, Another very well-known Christian leader, Grant Jeffries, if you know that name, Grant Jeffries, he spoke in the same auditorium in, the, in Jerusalem. Now, he didn't prophesy, but he was just warning against investment companies. And uh, he was talking about how 
um, millions are being put, uh, um, of millions of dollars are being put in uh, into investment companies, and he was concerned. That I cannot remember all, and uh, and I can't remember every little detail David Wilkinson said as well. And I'm not trying to discredit David Wilkinson, everyone. Like I said, I love the guy, and you know. The one thing that I'm spotlighting, spotlighting on doesn't take away the, you know, the 999,999 uh, good things that David Wilkerson has done. So I'm not trying to completely discredit him. Any other thoughts or comments? Just a, just a fun fact. We were in Jerusalem on like two cases, January 1st, in my uh, journal. I remember writing... It doesn't seem like it is as bad as everybody said it was going to be, but then I'm in Israel on the Sabbath and the whole world could have disappeared and we wouldn't know it. Right. Yeah. Very well put. I just wanted to respond to the sweet lady. It says Galaxy Tab on her identity, but I don't know her name. Um, but how you could you know, take a scripture, right, and make it say what you want it to say and thereby be deceived. So like, you know, when we talk about evangelism and, evangelism and we say, you know, you have to accept Jesus that he died and rose again and, and we can find scriptures for that, right? And, and I know those of us that are born again believers believe that. But when you read uh, Luke, and Matthew and the words of Jesus himself, you know, the, the lawyer comes up and says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, well, what's written in the law? And he repeats the Shema and also adds in Leviticus and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. And in Matthew, he adds in, and come follow me. But he doesn't say, recite the Romans road, because the Romans road wasn't even written yet, or put me in your heart. And these are things, you know, I call them canned Christian, you know, phrases that, that we use, but they totally discount following the law, like the law is a bad word, <laughs> you know, but it's both. You know, but you could pick out any of those. Yes. You could pick that out and say, well, you don't have to believe in the resurrection because it, he didn't say that. Right, right. Yeah. You know? and, it, and also, you know, you mentioned law. You know, there's two different laws. There's legalism and that we don't practice. But the Torah means in Hebrew, God's guidance, uh, his, what he wants to do, he wants for us to do. So there's two different laws, you know, you, you say law, it, it sounds terrible, but God says, follow his laws, follow his Torah, follow his guidance, follow his instruction. So when people use the word law in a negative way, it's really sad. <laughs> well, there's three, there's that law of sin and death, which really Paul's speaking about, right? That's what we're freed from is the law of sin and death, not the Torah. Right. Yeah, you know, there are, there are many, many examples in the scripture of two sides of a coin. Uh, peace, for example, the Lord said, you know, my peace I bring you, and he's called the Prince of Peace. Well, then he throws a curveball by saying in another context, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And see, this is where if it's if if we just use the word and like i like i said there is the biblical jesus and there's other jesuses out there then there is the living word of god but then there is the word that paul calls the letter which can kill that's what paul said and we can and and the devil used the word of god against the lord jesus so um this is where we need the Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom to discern that some people can take a verse and they can throw it into and they can bring it out of context or they can fit it into whatever they want. This is where deception can come, and especially for young, weak believers 
uh, who, who come under very, um, you know, smart, good talkers, charismatic leaders uh, and fall into deception. So may God give us all wisdom in these last days. And any final comments before we close in a word of prayer? All right, let me pray, everyone. Father God, we are uh, stirred up by your word, by, uh, by your spirit, Lord. And that's a good thing because, Lord, we want to grow. We want our mind to be challenged, Lord. But, Lord, we thank you that our identity is not changed because we are your children. You love us. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we are all students. We are all on the road to finding more and more truth. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a spirit of discernment, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of the fear of the Lord, a spirit of knowledge, Lord. Give us help. Lord, your word says, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. And may our... Uh, May our dissecting your word uh, be with, um, with wisdom. And Lord, may we be teachable, Lord. May we respect other, others' opinions. May, we, may you protect us, Lord, from being uh, stubborn. But at the same time, Lord, may our convictions be real, but may they be uh, balanced with, with your love, Lord. So bless my brothers and sisters. Bless us all, Lord, and thank you for your grace upon us all. Yevarechacha Adonai veishmarecha. Yae Adonai panav alecha veichonecha. Yisa Adonai panav alecha veyasem lecha. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his shalom peace. In Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior's name. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. Amen. 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 Thanks, brother. Great teaching. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Bye -bye. thank you.